In January 1949, the 13-year-old boy living there seemed like a perfectly normal teenager. Attending school, concentrating on his studies, he was slightly built and unathletic, preferring to stay indoors listening to his favorite programs on the radio and playing board games. Suddenly, witnesses say, a series of unexplained events began. Scratching sounds erupted from the walls and the floors of the family's home. The boy's bed would shake, furniture would slide across the room, and dresser drawers would fly open. At first, his parents thought these strange occurrences were related to the boy's distress over the recent death of a favorite aunt. The aunt had schooled the boy in her beliefs about communicating with the dead. He had tried contacting her through a Ouija board. Perhaps they thought the strange events were messages from the dead. The parents turned first to their Lutheran minister for help and later to doctors, but nothing worked. Then, deep scratches began appearing on the boy's body that witnesses said the boy could not have made. The minister suggested the family contact a Catholic priest. They went to St. James Church in Mount Rainier, Maryland to meet Father Albert Hughes. Hughes agreed to visit the boy. Later, over dinner at the rectory, Hughes told fellow priest Frank Bober about the meeting. He said that the room would get extremely cold to the point that you would be shivering. The boy was obviously the one that was responsible for moving objects around the room, like the phone off the desk. There was uh, a plethora of vehement uh, statements against God and sacred things. Father Hughes, just 29 years old at the time, was unprepared to deal with the bizarre force that seemed to be inhabiting the boy. He was certainly befuddled by all of this in terms of, you know, contemporary scientific input. But eventually he felt that, you know, there was no option but <laughs> that he was dealing with, you know, uh, a satanic forces. Father Hughes became convinced that exorcism, an arcane ritual requiring the approval of the archbishop, was the answer. The rite of exorcism was perfectly delineated, so his feeling was, well, I will follow this and it should work. The parents checked the boy into Washington's Georgetown University Hospital. He was strapped to the bed. Father Hughes blessed the child, knelt at the bedside, and the ritual began. He prayed in Latin to the saints. Then, calling on God, he commanded that the boy be delivered from evil. And the boy broke the strap and pulled out a spring and gashed Father Hughes's arm from the top to the wrist. Hughes, traumatized both physically and mentally, abandoned the exorcism and left St. James to recover. The boy's parents, worried now that their son could be violent, watched for new evidence of the supposedly evil presence. When freshly scratched markings on the boy's abdomen appeared, spelling the word Lewis, the parents believed they had a sign. They had relatives in St. Louis, where the boy's late aunt had lived, and they went there for help. Within days, the parents asked a Jesuit priest at nearby St. Louis University to perform an exorcism. It was early March, seven weeks into the boy's strange odyssey. The priest said before the archbishop would approve the exorcism, doctors would have to rule out all physical and mental causes for the boy's behavior. The doctors claimed they did. The Archbishop chose the 52-year-old pastor of the university's church, Father William Bowdern, as the exorcist. Bowdern had the required qualifications according to his superior. He was pious, prudent, and mature of years, just as the exorcism ritual dictated. Bowdern asked a professor and fellow priest, Raymond Bishop, then 43 years old, to assist him. 
He also included Walter Halloran. I used to drive her father about her, and uh, one evening just before supper, he came up to me and he asked, he said, uh, would you take me someplace tonight? And so I said, sure. A 26-year-old seminary student at the time, Father Halloran had no idea he was about to assist in an exorcism until Father Bowden began the prayers in the home of the boy's relatives. And I was kneeling at the foot of the bed, leaning on the bed with my elbows, and the bed started going up and down. I guess I looked a little surprised because he stopped for a minute and just looked over and says, don't worry. So I went on with the prayers and then I think the next thing that happened is that uh, a bottle of holy water flew across the room. It was sitting on a bureau and it went flying across the room, crashed into the wall. The two priests performed the ritual as Father Halloran and family members held the boy down. Night after night, the priest tried to pin relics of saints on the boy and place a crucifix in his hand. They sprinkled holy water and repeatedly recited the prayers of the exorcism ritual. During the prayers of exorcism, the child would become real agitated and thrash around. Holy water would always bring a reaction from the little boy, you know, of anger, of, uh, not wanting the holy water sprinkled on him and that sort of thing. The boy also showed extreme anger toward the priests, according to the author of The Exorcist, William Peter Blatty. The boy was able to spit copiously and prodigious distances with remarkable accuracy. He could spit across a room 20 to 25 feet and hit a priest in the eye, and apparently was unerring. There were a couple of times when the child would uh, make statements about people that were present. He addressed one of the priests, who I think was only there once, and he said, oh, he says, I'm surprised to see you in hell. He says, how did you ever get down here? The ordeal usually ended well after midnight, and the boy would fall asleep. The priests recorded the night's events in a diary signed by all the witnesses memory of what had occurred the night before. When the exorcism in St. Louis entered its third week, Father Bowden suggested the boy should convert to Catholicism. Do you know what a sacrament is? The parents agreed, and the boy began to take religious instruction during the day in the rectory of the St. Louis University Church. Bowden also decided to move the exorcism there, Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Now, closer to the church, the intensity of the boy's reactions increased. Bloody brandings again rose on his body in the form of words and figures. There would be arrows, I remember arrows. Uh, another time the word hell appeared. It was very, very uh, exact. You know, you didn't have to work your imagination to see what it was. But most of the time, they'd be long welts that would go down his arms, down his legs, across his abdomen, and on his chest. Uh, one time, uh, one of the spots has looked something like the, you know, the hooded drawings you have of the devil. In one account that was so vivid, Father Bowden recounted in his diary that while he was speaking to the boy, he happened to glance down at his leg, and before his eyes, was as though this tiny, this was a two-prong pitchfork, ran all the way down from his inner upper thigh down to about the ankle, uh, drawing blood all the way down. The ritual explicitly prohibits dialogue with the demon, but directs the exorcist to demand answers to two questions. What is your name? And what is the day and hour you will depart? So you ask those, and then you pause, for an answer. Sometimes an answer is given. Like one time the child respond, le responded legion to what is your name. At other times the boy speaking in an unfamiliar voice identified himself as spite or the devil. One night the voice reportedly offered to prove that it was the devil. I will awaken the boy, it said, and he will be pleasant. The boy instantly awoke, and he was calm. Later, the voice said, I will wake him up 
and he will be awful. The boy woke up in a cursing fit. The voice would often taunt the priests, saying that a certain word had to be revealed before the spirit would leave. As closely as I can remember, these are the words. I will not go until he says a certain word, and I will not, him, will not let him say the word. By now, according to Halloran, the battle for the boy's soul seemed endless. Night after night, the exorcist would order them to return to the rectory, repeat the ritual, and confront the forces of the unexplained. By April 1949, the teenage boy supposedly possessed by the devil had undergone almost five weeks of nightly exorcism rites. The boy's physical condition had weakened dramatically, and the priests feared that he was becoming dangerously ill. As a precaution, the exorcist decided to move the boy again, this time to the Alexian Brothers Catholic Hospital near St. Louis University. No one noticed when someone placed a statue of St. Michael the Archangel in the room. The exorcist intensified his efforts to convert the boy to Catholicism. He wanted him to accept communion. Every time Father Bowden would go to give him a host, then he'd start acting very wildly and have to be held. He had knocked the host out of Father Bowden's hand, and uh, he hit Father Bowden, and uh, you know, then he grit his teeth and just refused to accept anything in his mouth. It must have taken two hours before he accepted the host. Easter passed with no change in the boy's behavior. The exorcist felt an urgent need to try something different. He decided to ask the ritual's required questions in English, not Latin. At first, there was the usual mix of spitting and cursing, but then the boy cried out. He said St. Michael was present. St. Michael the Archangel was present, and then he described him. In a deep, mature voice, the boy then said, Satan, I command you to leave in the name of Dominus. Leave now. The exorcist believed the boy had at last uttered the word of release, Dominus, Latin for Lord. Suddenly, according to Halloran, the boy struggled and his body contorted wildly. The child became very violent and uh, there was a huge noise explosion or report and a very very bright light in the sanctuary of the church and that disappeared the boy fell into a deep sleep when he awoke he said the ordeal was over he told of dreaming of a beautiful angel who carried a fiery sword and conquered demons then he fell back asleep when the boy awoke again all memories of his exorcism had vanished. The boy and his family returned to Maryland and converted to Catholicism. For nearly five decades, witnesses have protected his identity. Now, in his 60s, they say he has lived a rather ordinary life. He named his son Michael. Did an evil spirit possess the boy? Did a medieval ritual free a child from the grasp of Satan? Father Bowder, now deceased, confirmed the exorcism in a letter to author William Peter Blatty. He said, I can tell you one thing. The case that I was involved in was the real thing. I had no doubt about it then. I have no doubt about it now. The fact that the exorcism was successful is it shows that uh, the power of God is certainly stronger than the power of the devil. Skeptics dismiss Halloran's claim. Their explanations for the boy's actions do not include the devil. A professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, Henry Kelly, a former Jesuit seminarian, says he believes the boy's so-called possessed behavior was brought on by the exorcism ritual itself. As soon as he began the rite of exorcism, then the symptoms of possession began. And I uh, conclude from this uh, that 
the very right of exorcism caused the symptoms of possession. This is a phenomenon that has happened in the past, that uh, suggestion brings the symptoms on, and suggestion cures the symptoms. Blatty, however, says Father Bowdern tested that theory. The exorcist would attempt to trick the boy, and instead of reading the, the ritual in Latin, they would read Caesar's Gallic Wars to see what the response would be, and there would be a fiendish demonic It never happened. Others speculate that the boy and his aunt had an inappropriate physical relationship, and her death triggered his condition. Jesuit priest Francis Cleary, a professor of theology at St. Louis University, contends the exorcism is a story of incest and psychological dysfunction, not possession. It would seem to me, from what I have read and uh, encountered, that we're dealing with the case of a boy who has just moved into puberty, who may well have had a prehistory of incestuous encounters with his aunt. It would be a mistake to take that experience of psychological sickness, disease, and paranormal phenomena, and without justification, throw that into a religious context. Leave religion out of it. It doesn't belong here. Psychiatrist Dr. David Baer says new research about brain disorders may provide medical explanations for the boy's so-called possession. The brain is... ...boy's so-called possession. The brain is a combination of electrical circuits and chemical systems. Uh, the way one brain cell signals another, in most cases, is by releasing a chemical. So abnormal chemicals in the brain can produce unusual states, changes in behavior, a sense of possession. Dr. Baer says the boy may have suffered from temporal lobe epilepsy. Temporal lobe epilepsy can be caused by things like infections, encephalitis, an infection of the brain, and that can be temporary. Temporal lobe seizures often begin in puberty. Baer thinks seizures in the temporal lobe, which is connected to what's known as the autonomic nervous system, may also explain the skin welts. And he's skeptical about the accounts of words spelled out on the boy's body. And I do wonder, in the case of this young boy, whether some of the people who observed the welts and the changes in his skin added their own interpretation of what they saw. Halloran believes the welts, like the boy's so-called possession, were real and cannot be explained by modern science. I think that anyone could uh, suffer possession. And I think it's basically because of the power that Satan has and then also inherent weaknesses that we have. My own feeling is that this particular case was an authentic case of possession, whatever that is, and that the boy had lucid moments in which he was not under that influence, but during which he did what this psychic, he vamped. Here were priests all around him conducting this grand and formal impressive rite of exorcism, witnesses in the room. I'm guessing that he just played along for a portion of it, but that other than these spells, he, he was in the grip of something inexplicable. Neither mental illness nor neurological disease can possibly explain the accounts of the shaking bed or the flying drawers. Were the 48 priests, doctors, and family members mistaken when they attested to the otherworldly events they witnessed? Skeptics say yes and argue that the roots of the boy's behavior are in his brain. Believers say the true cause stares at us from the molten depths of the unexplained. Evil, for those who believe, makes its mark in many ways. Exorcists supposedly can banish a single devil or banish dozens of demons from a single person. For many Pentecostal Christians, the hushed tones of what they call deliverance wrenches the demons from their unwilling host while launching a believer on a journey through the unexplained. In September 1990, 25-year-old Ellen Carney moved from Hartford, Connecticut to Pasadena, California and enrolled in graduate school at Fuller Theological Seminary. Ellen felt a new life beginning for her. Stricken at birth by a severe muscle disease, she had survived a troubled childhood 
with a mother whom Ellen alleges sexually abused her. As a teenager, her mother committed her to a hospital for people with physical disabilities. There, feeling abandoned, Ellen turned to drugs, heavy metal rock music, and the occult. Then a friend gave her a Bible and invited her to attend a local Pentecostal church service. For the first time in her life, Ellen says she felt a personal relationship with God and became a born-again Christian. Now at Fuller, she hoped to deepen her faith, but her new life took on an ominous edge. She says strange things began to happen. Her bed would shake so violently it would awaken her. There was all sorts of strange phenomena, lights going on, uh, things moving around. I was experiencing strange happenings like almost being hit by a car three times in the same week and voices in my head that I knew weren't my own thoughts. I would get this enormous burst of loud, sort of antagonistic voices saying negative things about me. Just a lot of strange things that I couldn't explain and that scared me. Confused and afraid, Ellen Carney searched for spiritual guidance. One of her friends recommended she talk to Reverend Charles Kraft, an evangelical minister and a professor at Fuller. In addition to his counseling skills, Kraft is a specialist in deliverance, the Pentecostal version of exorcism. I want all spirits out of mind, emotions, and will in the name of Jesus Christ. During a deliverance, Reverend Kraft says he addresses each demon, naming it by its function, before he casts it out. Spirit of doubt, what does this do to you? She's getting stronger. She's getting stronger. Mm. That's bad news for you, huh? Mm. I'll give you to the count of three, and after that the angels come after you with their swords. One, two, three. Ellen knew Kraft practiced deliverance, but she doubted she could be possessed by demons. When I went to see him, I had no idea what I would say. I just went because I thought I had no other choice. In their first two meetings, Reverend Kraft and Carney discussed her troubled past. By the third session, Kraft had determined she was demonized. Having demons sort of feels like being slimed. It just feels like being covered in some kind of muck or just being mired down. It's just a really dirty feeling. Kraft asked Ellen if he could challenge her demons. She agreed. Next, Chuck asked me to close my eyes, and he directly addressed the demons in me. All of a sudden, the demon turns up, and you're talking to a demon instead of to, uh, to Ellen. When the demon spoke, Ellen believed for the first time that evil spirits lived inside her. The demons answered to specific names fear, depression, death. When Kraft asked who was in charge, he says the demon of death answered. Lord, keep me safe and open. Carney documented the deliverance in her diary. Death did most of the talking and had a much stronger feel and attitude. Though Chuck didn't get louder, he got much firmer and commanded it in Jesus' name to answer. In the name of Jesus, now we... Reverend Kraft believes he then took authority over the demons and ordered them to leave. According to Kraft, once a demon leaves, it cannot return. I've tested this several times, uh, including with, with Ellen. Uh, and when there's been a, another demon that we had to deal with, I've said, are you the same one that we had kicked out before? He said, no, uh, that one can't come back. Why? Because you forbid it to come back. And he would just send them away. Usually I could see that mm -hmm. and felt a real difference. Ellen met with Reverend Kraft every week for nine months and sensed more than a dozen demons leaving her. But she knew others remained. At night, I'd get awakened and I would see spirits in my room. And if I rebuked them in the name of Christ, they would leave. But I was sometimes so terrified I didn't remember to do that. When I had demons, it felt like I couldn't get away from that evil, that pervasive sort of darkness. After meeting with Reverend Kraft for more than a year, the weight of the demons, according to Carney, finally lifted. And when the demons left, so did the voices in her head. I know that I don't have demons living in me. 
I feel peaceful, I feel free, I feel calm. And I also feel whole in the sense of being one person together. I have my life, I know my memories. My life makes sense now. Did unseen demons inhabit Ellen Carney? Did they create violent and vicious thoughts within her? Believers say demons are real. Kraft insists that people like Ellen often must have their demons banished before they can address underlying psychological issues. A psychological problem doesn't talk to me. A demon does. That's a major difference. A, a, a simple problem. But a demon that's reinforcing that and does. The reason she had come in the first place was that she was having some struggles, in, uh, emotional struggles, and, and uh, so we knew that we had to deal with that, and that's the important stuff to deal with. Kraft, however, has no professional training in psychology. And in fact, modern science and all psychological theory hold that demons do not exist. The psychological community overwhelmingly agrees that demons are just another name for a troubled psyche. There's no scientific evidence for demons at all, and I personally don't believe they exist. And it's really just a name that, and, that people are putting on it. And, you know, I mean, it's no different to, from my saying, well, I think all your hang-ups are caused by a large green buzzard named Fred who is right behind my back. I mean, do you believe he's there? Beierstein says that in cases like Carney's, perception can be easily distorted. Extreme stress can change brain chemistry. Under those conditions, perception and reality can diverge. And that individual has no way of telling whether it's something going on out there in, in the real world and being sent up via the sensory pathways or whether it's something going on in the theater of their own minds. Ellen's feeling of possession, according to Beierstein, could also be linked to her strong beliefs in a demon-filled religion. When somebody has urges that they don't understand and feelings that they don't understand, and it's a label they can grasp, and it, it then and that label brings with it a whole lot of other baggage that uh, causes people to expect certain things to happen. Some psychologists would say that all this was was explainable psychologically, but then I would have to say to them that there's no way I could have caused the external manifestations that happened around me. How do you explain your bed moving? How do you explain things in your house moving? Scientists would argue that Carney only thought her bed moved. They would suggest that her brain played tricks on her. Believers would say the tricks are part of a deadly game played by demonic agents from the unexplained. Exorcism relies on the shrouded mysteries and candlelit rituals of religion. Traditional psychotherapy derives from rational, secular analysis. Despite these vast differences, some therapists have embraced exorcism, adding a mystical adjunct to their therapeutic regimen and entering the world of the unexplained. In the fall of 1982, Margaret Swift, a trained hospital dietitian from Cupertino, California, needed a minor surgical procedure. Margaret recalls she was in otherwise perfect health when she entered the hospital. But when she returned home the next day, she felt new and unexplained symptoms. Oh, well, the symptoms were immediately. Uh, after I got home, my legs were heavy, my feet were heavy. Uh, it was hard to walk. I seemed to be eating normally, but in three days' time, I lost 15 pounds. In two weeks, Margaret returned to see her surgeon. He said her symptoms had nothing to do with the surgery and referred her to a specialist who ordered a battery of tests, none of which showed anything abnormal. It was very frustrating, wondering if they ever were going to find something wrong and would it be a terminal illness of some nature. Weeks passed, then months. With doctors unable to treat Margaret's strange exhaustion, she qualified for medical disability. After six years, Margaret became curious about an alternative therapy and read The Unquiet Dead by California psychologist Edith Fiore. The book described Fiore's belief that some people afflicted with mysterious diseases may actually be possessed by spirits of the dead. 
Fiore, who says she has performed exorcisms on hundreds of patients, theorizes that the spirits usually enter humans at cemeteries and hospitals where lost souls linger. Margaret noticed a similarity between her illness and those described in Fiore's book. She was skeptical that hypnotism could remove spirits of the dead, but desperate to find a cure, she made an appointment with Fiore. All right, have you ever been hypnotized before, Margaret? No, I haven't been. Fiore considered the strange symptoms Margaret presented, intermittent disorientation, and worst of all, the nagging heaviness in her legs. The psychologist immediately linked Margaret's past hospitalization to spirit possession. Fiore and Swift agreed to recreate the earlier exorcism. Fiore then began what she called the depossession process by putting Margaret under hypnosis and addressing the spirit directly. Your name is it, Margaret. When you go into the spirit world, you're going to be in a perfect body of your own. So you don't need to be in Margaret's body. Go in the name of the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. Go in peace and light and love. You must leave now. It was like a balloon bursting or something, and uh, it, it seemed to leave through the solar plexus. When she emerged from hypnosis, Margaret says she felt completely different. The heaviness had disappeared, and she actually felt light on her feet. She couldn't wait to show her husband how she had changed. I said, you can't imagine what happened, Bill. I got rid of this heavy feeling in my feet and legs. And he could tell by the expression on my face that something happened. Fifteen years after her experience, the symptoms that drove Margaret to an exorcist have never returned. Did a spirit possess Margaret Swift's body, causing chronic fatigue? Fiore says she has no doubt in the reality of possessive spirits and the effectiveness of her ritual. Having used it for 20 years, I now have come to believe that these spirits do indeed exist, and they do indeed possess living people. This is therapy. This works. This needs to be done. Most psychologists, however, have grave doubts about Fiore's views. Clinical psychologist Jeffrey Youngren says her methods belong in a religious cult, not in psychotherapy. Hypnosis to get in touch with theoretical spirits, uh, to engage in theoretical exorcisms, none of which have any validity in, in models of science that we accept today, is d significantly outside the uh, standard of care. Um, that kind of practice is really just not what psychology or psychotherapy is. Youngren charges that Fiore's methods are not only highly unorthodox, but dangerous. I can see that kind of an introduction to a delusional system, to use a clinical term, uh, stressing a fragile patient and causing them to fall apart. Uh, that, uh, and in fact, I have been involved in one specific case where that did occur, that there was a, an exorcism, if you will, a spirit removal, and the end result of that was that the patient was, uh, was psychiatrically hospitalized. Fiore insists that her methods work, but Youngren believes Margaret Swift was cured simply because she expected to be cured. If someone enters a session with an expectancy that something's going to happen, we can bring about vast changes in, in them through that expectancy. Did a psychologist banish a spirit and resolve her patient's symptoms? Scientists argue that Swift's recovery was the lucky result of the power of suggestion, not a real cure. Others see a vibrant and healthy woman and credit her spontaneous recovery to the departure of a lost soul of the unexplained. A belief in demonic possession and the cleansing power of exorcism is common to many religions around the world. In most cases, those, re in most cases, those religions have codified and formalized the exorcism ritual. The raw, powerful essence of the rite has for the most part vanished, except in remote tribal villages 
where the spirit of the unexplained has a face. For the Himba of southwestern Africa, tribal life brims with the lives of the spirits. The Himba traditions hold that spirits cause all human illness and that only exorcism carried out by a native healer can restore health. Western eyes have rarely viewed these centuries-old rites. Photographers Angela Fisher and Carol Beckwith captured the rituals in photographs and on video. This exclusive footage has never been seen before. These are the three wives of a dead tribesman. Himba villagers knew a spirit from the animal world had entered the women's bodies. Several months earlier, their husband had been killed by a lion, and it was believed that he had sent his spirit, the lion spirit, back into the village to pull his three wives into the afterworld to join him. And when the lion spirit took them over, they were completely animal-like. They were growling. They were uttering guttural sounds. They were crawling on the ground on their hands and knees. They were attacking each other. They were no longer human beings in the sense that we would recognize them. The dead man's wives remained in their trance.